That looks good. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Learn to Write Branching Interactive Narratives with Yarn Spinner. This is the second of two Yarn Spinner talks. This is the, the simple one. For some reason, the advanced one was on first. Not entirely sure why. Either way, hello, I'm Paris. Uh, I'm from the Yarn Spinner team. This talk is about how you can write branching interactive narratives with Yarn Spinner. It's mostly a live demo. So I'm going to awkwardly hunch over my computer and type things while we talk about it. If anyone has any questions, most of the Yarn Spinner team is also here at the front and they can answer your questions at the end. So I probably won't use the whole session and we can have a chat if anyone wants to have a chat because I've had lots of great questions already this week about Yarn Spinner. It's been fun. The slide is not progressing, but it is on my computer. Okay. It is just slow. There's multiple decimators in the chain now. Hi, I'm from Hobart, which looks a lot like Wellington, only has better coffee. Yeah. See, two of the places we speak most often are Melbourne and Wellington, and that joke works in both, and they both get offended. <laughs> it's great. But Hobart actually looks a lot like Wellington, right? Yarn Spinner is a really fun little narrative tool that we built. It's really not progressing. This is fun. We'll find out if it works outside of Keynote in a minute. Yarn Spinner is a really cool little narrative tool that we built uh, many years ago for open source, uh, as an open source project for Night in the Woods. I would really like to see my slides. There we go, okay. This is some of the games that it's been used for since. So it's free and open source. Everything I'm showing you today is basically totally free and you can go use it. So this is not really a sales pitch. Or if it is a sales pitch, we're really bad at this. Um, <laughs> these are some of the great games that we love that are powered by Yarn Spinner. One of the especially, like Dredge is a New Zealand classic at this point, right? Um, most of these games are use Yarn Spinner for some of their mechanics or part of their mechanics or all these mechanics. All of these games do that. Silly thing to say. Okay. Oh my god. Give up on that. Okay, I'm just going to talk. Or just show you my slides, actually. That could work. This talk is called Learn to Write Branching Interactive Narratives with Yarn Spinner, and Yarn Spinner actually means multiple things. So part of the talk is about the different things that Yarn Spinner is. The first thing that Yarn Spinner is, it's a scripting language. The scripting language is often called Yarn. Yarn script, Yarn, yarn code, Yarn stories but it's just a .yarn extension. It's actually just a text file. We've had some interesting conversations this week where people are like, does yarn spinner work with source control, version control really nicely? And then they've breathed a massive sigh of relief when I've said it's just a text file. So yarn, yarn spinner basically works with text files, which is great news, apparently, I'm told. The other thing that yarn spinner is, oh, it is working now, okay, great, is a Visual Studio Code extension. So sometimes when I say Visual Studio Code to writers who are not programmers, they don't know what I am talking about. And they're like, that's Microsoft. Microsoft is like, the thing that the operating system is, not the programming editor. If you are not familiar with Visual Studio Code, uh, it's a, basically just a programmer's editor. We've written a really good extension for it that makes it a good place to write Yarn. And I'll show you that in a minute. That's the second thing that you could consider to be Yarn Spinner. And the third part of Yarn Spinner, yes, it's working now, is the plugin for an engine. In this case, I'm going to show you Unity today because it's the engine I'm the most familiar with. But we have a Yarn Spinner plugin for Godot, for Bevy, which is a Rust engine. Uh, we have a JavaScript version, and we have an Unreal version in beta. So it works with most engines. So the story here is you write Yarn script in a nice editor, optimally Visual Studio Code, but you can use anything because it's just a text file, and then you run it in your engine of some kind. Uh, we also have a JavaScript or a TypeScript version of the Yarn uh, runner, which you can theoretically use on the web. We don't really talk about that one as much, but we'll probably start talking about that a bit more. So those are the three things. Oh, I haven't had a transition. I forgot. Brilliant. Lovely. Go me. Let's start with the first one of those, the syntax of Yarn script. So I'm going to quickly go through the syntax. It's doing it again. I'm going to quickly go through the syntax before I actually start doing a live demo. I'm just going to go to the live demo. To hell with it. Okay, so to do this live demo, oh, that's actually much better than the slides. Okay, to do this live demo, I'm just going to use a thing we call Try Yarn Spinner, which you can go to at this URL, and it will give you the script that I'm looking at right now. You don't need to follow along, but if you wanted to, it's available at try.yarnspinner.dev slash hash nzgdc24. If you just go to try.yarnspinner.dev, that's the default page. There's a specific script I put there that is the one I'm going to show you today. So this is yarn script. You can see it on the left here. Yarn is broken up into nodes. This is a node called start. It starts with three dashes. And then there's a bunch of text inside. I'll get to that in a second. And a node ends with the three equal signs down here. Inside a node, there are lines. You can see there are numbered lines here. Each line is a line of dialogue, which will get delivered to your game engine one by one. Often lines of dialogue have a character name in front of them, so you can also do this. And you've got a character name in front of it, but that's not required. You can have a line of dialogue with or without a character name. And 
this is this try yarn spinner tool lets you run your dialogue to test it. This is not really designed as a production tool. This is designed as something that you can go and get familiar with yarn spinner or share it with people so they can understand if yarn spinner is something they want to play with. It's not really designed for production, but if you click the test button in the top right corner, it's going to make it a little bit bigger. You can play through. So you'll see here the lines come in one by one in the same order they're available. Hopefully this isn't too confusing. So each line gets delivered. The magic of writing branching dialogue starts to happen once you start using the jump command. So the jump command is this thing. The jump command lets you move to another node. So commands in yarn spinner are separated by triangle brackets, just like that. You'll see here this slash just means I've escaped that, so that means it will print in the, in the view. So putting the slash there means yarn spinner didn't try and run it, instead just printed it for us. But if I can click continue, it will jump us to another node. So you'll see here, this jump command here took us to the node, another node. And it continues, now we're inside another node, rather creatively it's called another node, we're inside it now. And we can jump again if we want to, so we're jumping to yet another node. And here we are in yet another node. So that's a fairly linear set of branches though, so it's not very interesting. If you were to visualise this as a graph, it would just be a straight line. Writers tend to want to tell stories that change. I don't know why, it's very frustrating. It would be a lot simpler if they kept it simple. But here we are. Options allow players to decide what happens next. For some reason, us game developers, we keep pandering to the gamers for some reason and letting them choose things. Letting them choose things, they seem to like it, so we keep doing it. In Yarn Spinner, you let people choose things with a little symbol we call the option, which is just a dash and another arrow. And that way you can provide options. So here we are, two options. I'd like a poem about options, or I'd prefer to keep learning Yarn Spinner. And because these are also just lines, they get delivered over here. So now if I pick one of these, I'd prefer to keep learning Yarn Spinner. Nothing actually happens because we haven't told it to do anything. So this option is just, it gets presented, and then Yarn Spinner just continues after the option because we didn't do anything inside that option. So to make options go somewhere, we pair them with the jump statement, which is the thing we learned earlier. So here are the same set of options again. I'd like, I'd still like a poem about options, or I'd still prefer to keep learning Yarn Spinner. But this time, if I pick one of those, it will then run the appropriate jump statement. You'll see there's a line below it that will probably be never shown because it doesn't ever have the capability to get there. So these two options. Because we can't continue within this node without picking an option, that line will never run. So I'm going to ask for a poem about options. And it's going to jump to the poem about options node, which is this one. I was going to use an LLM to write the poem, but I decided that was beneath me. So there you have to deal with my bad poetry. Um, let's keep learning. So we, then we jump to another node. Inside this node, we're going to declare a variable. So you'll see here, we use this declare syntax and declare a variable, which we call name. And we set the, the, the default value of the variable to Bob, because Bob's basically the default name, right? At least in like, you know, English colonial countries. So it says, my name is Bob. And what you see here is we are uh, interpolating the value of that variable into the character spot. So now there is a character. The person we've been speaking to the whole time turns out they're called Bob. And they say, my name is Bob. And then they ask you, should, should I change it? And you can change it to Reginald. I don't know why I picked these names. Reginald or Daisy, or you can leave it as Bob. And if we pick Reginald, it sets the name, which is the variable we made a moment ago, to Reginald is dead. Hopefully this is pretty straightforward. This is just very simple programming. It's just for writers, so it has to be even simpler than you expect. That's, that's not meant to be funny, that's legitimate. Like you, you don't want the writers having to think about stuff when they're trying to write a story. So we're gonna change it to Daisy. So you'll see here, try tells you what's happened with the variable, that's just for convenience sake, so you can play with things and test it. And now the character is Daisy. So you'll see here this line, which runs after this set of options, doesn't actually specify what the character name is, it just says name, right -o. So whatever name we picked is now in here, very useful. And then we can continue. And you can say no let's end, which runs one of the inbuilt yarn commands called stop, which just stops executing at that point. I'm not gonna click that, because that's not fun. So we're gonna jump to the node more learning. Inside more learning, we're gonna declare another variable. And the, uh, what do we call it, Daisy, is now gonna say, it looks like you only have this amount of money. And because we declared another variable called money, uh, set it to two, so it's like you don't have much money. And you can say yes, alas, and we jump to another node. You can say give me more and they'll give you some extra money and you can see here we use a set command to update the value of money to increment it by 50. And then you can say oh I've got that much money now. And you can say, or you can say no my business and you'll also jump, which is functionally the same as the first option. So I'm gonna say give me more. And they say hmm, fine, there you go. And now you'll see our money has been updated to 52. 
you can say, oh nice, I've got $52 now. And that's just to, so you can see that interpolating the value of variables inside statements works inside options, which is quite useful. You can put as much stuff as below an option as you like, just for whatever reason, I've only put one or two lines and a jump after an option. And have to get moving. So we're in final learning now. And in final learning, we do one more thing just to show off what we're doing. We say, can you do anything useful? And they say lots of things, but we don't have time. And you can ask if you can spend your money on something if you have more money than two. So this option here, because it has a condition on it on the side here, this if statement, it will only be sent if that condition evaluates to true. So that option will only be available if we have more money than two. And because we have 52 money, 52 units of money, you will get that option. And you can say, what can I spend my money on? Oh, alas, nothing. You know, late stage capitalism, there's nothing we can do. So then they say goodbye, and that's the end of execution. So that is a very simple introduction to the basics of Yarn Spinner. If you want to start learning Yarn Spinner, the best way to do it is with Try. It's just free on the web. If you go to the URL, which is here, that is the script you were just looking at, I would highly recommend you play with that first. That is not the only way you can do Yarn Spinner. Now, before I, before I jump back to something slightly more interesting, I'm going to say you can click this export player button. So save script will just download the Yarn file we made. So it will give you a Yarn file. So now I have a file, which is this, the script we made. But export player. What are we going to do? Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, I did that earlier. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, if I click export player, we will get a standalone HTML file, which we can then use to get a job at the big AAA studio by sharing our stories. So that is a completely standalone HTML file, which you can email to anyone or play around with yourself or just you know look at and giggle. Uh, that lets you play the story you've written in Try. So it's not necessarily designed for making a game like Twine, for example, might be designed for making a whole text-based game, but there are people doing such things. Uh, this one thing over here you may notice is that how do I get rid of that now? Oh, whatever. One thing you may notice over here is you can pick which node to start on with this runner, which is potentially quite useful for testing things. So you can start execution at a certain point. Uh, you can also ask it to deliver lines one at a time, or if there's a block of lines that would come in, you can make it send all at once. And you can ask it for, for example, when that option was potentially not available because we didn't have enough money, you can make it show it with a strike through to represent that it's unavailable or hide it completely and show variables. And you can also restart. We think this is quite useful for, for playing with ideas. So that's, that's one thing. I'm going to close that so I don't forget. Let's try Yarn Spinner. I'm going to go back to my slides and see if they work. Oh, look, they caught up. Lines. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. OK. Look at that. We did all this already. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Wonderful. There's lots of things. There's lots of features. We'll get to some of these features in a minute as I go through. Let's try Yarn Spinner. So try.yarnspinner.dev slash hash nzgdc24. You can play with it. There's a picture of it. Oh, look, live demo one. We got there. And here's the export to HTML feature. So you can you know, send an HTML copy of your game to people if you would like to show it off. <laughs> oh, it's doing it again. OK, whatever. We're going to go back here. The next thing I'm going to show you is Yarn Spinner for Visual Studio Code. So Yarn Spinner for Visual Studio Code is a plugin for Visual Studio Code that allows you to write Yarn in Visual Studio Code, the programming editor, with all the nice features that make it good. So I've just dragged a folder which happens to have a single yarn file in it. Actually, I'll just show you that. It's got some other stuff in it. I lied, but I'll show you what they are in a minute. This folder has functionally has a single yarn file in it. I've dragged it into Visual Studio Code, which is this programming editor thing. And in this editor, I have many garbage plugins installed because I'm a game developer. But one of them is this one, which is the Yarn Spinner plugin, which adds a bunch of features to Visual Studio Code that make it understand yarn files. We'll go through all these features in a minute. But functionally, you can tell it's running because in the bottom right-hand corner, way down here, you can see it's detected we're running a Yarn Spinner file. Not visible, says John. Whatever. It says Yarn Spinner in the bottom right-hand corner. You'll have to trust me. OK. Trust me. OK, I'm going to zoom out a little bit too. This is functionally, at least I, I was dicking around with the story early, so it's very close to the same story you were looking at in Try. This is the correct way to write Yarn Stories when you're actually making a game. If you are purely a narrative person and you are not used to running programming tools, the thing you have to remember is all programmers' editors are absolute bullshit. They're full of nonsense that pops up all the time, disrupts your flow, and interrupts you. But this is as good as it gets. So you'll see here the, the story we've been working on is in here. 
You'll see we have some nice syntax highlighting that allows you to kind of understand what your story's doing without, you know, going blind. And you'll see we have some extra metadata up here, which I'll get to in a minute. So the first feature I'm going to show you is this show graph button up here. I'm assuming the top is visible. Yeah, okay, cool. Show graph. So can anyone guess what show graph does? It shows a graph. Very sharp for 3.15 on the last day of a conference, aren't you? So here is the graph view. And this represents the relationships between the nodes that you have created. So you can see here we start with the start node, we move to the another node, we move to yet another node, and then we go to either poem about options, we get my bad poem, and then we go back to keep learning, or we go directly to keep learning, and so on. So this visualizes the relationships that you have defined in your yarn story using the jump commands. With me so far? Yep, no, okay. So you will see here that you can jump to a specific node over here, so you can use the top right thing to jump. I'm not gonna zoom in that, because it's slightly fragile to zoom and scroll, but, you can jump, you can click add node, which will just create a, probably at the bottom, yep. So add node, the button here will create an empty node for you in the text view. The graph view is just a visualization of the text. So there's nothing fancy going on under the hood, it's just showing you what it thinks is the text is doing. I'm just gonna delete that one. You can hover over any node and go showing graph view. So for example, I wanna jump to this final learning node, I click the little showing graph view here, it'll jump the graph view to that node. It'll also tell me how many times something's referred to, so we can see how many jumps there are to a specific node, which can be quite useful if you're trying to figure out what your story's doing, because this is a very simple story and stories get massive. So, I'm gonna turn my tablet back on so I have my actual running sheet, which I was gonna talk about. There we go. Okay, so. Scrolly scroll. Okay, so this is the graph view, this is the, the text editor. There's a lot of things you can do inside here now you're using a proper program's editor. I'm gonna push Command Shift P, I think it's Control Shift P on Windows or Linux. So Command Shift P will bring up the, I don't know what this is called, the, the command palette for Visual Studio Code. And if you type yarn spinner, you'll get a bunch of commands available that allow you to see the kind of things you can do in here. The first one is Preview Dialog, which is the one I'm gonna show you it basically runs the same thing that you saw in Try. So you can execute your story and play through it. Exactly the same thing. This is actually the same thing as that export I showed you earlier. So it's got the, the thing that lets you pick the start node and stuff like that. Quite useful. Uh, that's that. Very good. There are some other things in there which we'll talk about. You can hide and show the graph view as well. And I'll talk about the other things. You can probably guess what they are because they're named sensibly, but we'll get back to it. I'm gonna show you a couple of quick other things before we move on. Just gonna close that graph view for a second. So the metadata at the top lets you, as you can see, it's storing the position of the node for the node graph there, but you can do other things. So if I go color red, Reginald is trying to complete, but yeah, if I go color red and then bring the graph view back, you'll see it's now color red. I didn't have to hide the graph view for that to happen, I was just hiding it so I could type, so I can change it live, I can make it green, whatever. That can be helpful to kind of flag different nodes of certain things. Some people like to make the start of a story red, uh, green and the ends red, and things like that. But you can use that however you wish. Uh, so we'll make that one green. You can also group nodes. So is that font still big enough to see? Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so you can also group nodes. So say for example, we considered like this block in the middle, another, yet another node, keep learning and more learning and final learning. So these four, yet another node, keep learning, more learning, final learning, to be like the learning nodes. So we could go in and put a group in, so we could say group learning, and then put that in all the nodes that we think are the learning nodes, and it will put a little box around them, which kind of just helps us stay with what we're doing. So now that's kind of visualized as a, a set of things that, that moves together. And if we move it, you know, it tries to draw the box around all of them. Quite useful for writers to be able to think about what they're doing. Uh, we can also, you know, keep programming in here. So for example, I'm gonna get rid of this entire story, just, you know, for fun. It's gone. I'm gonna go title start, third, and grab this, just as an example of some other things we can do. So this is a small, different example. I was gonna show you this in try, but then the slides flustered me and I forgot about it. You get the idea. This is an example, ooh, hello. This is an example of one of the built-in uh, commands or functions from YarnSpinner, which we call visited. So this check here, this is an if statement, which is basically checking if this condition is true, and if it's true, it does this line, else it does this line. So this special YarnSpinner command, which is built into YarnSpinner, will basically tell you if you have been to a certain node referred to by name. So in this case, we're saying, if the node named special node, which is down here, has been visited, then 
uh, spit out the, the following line, do you want to go to the special node? You have visited the special node before. We'll get to the rest in a second. Otherwise, just say, do you want to go to the special node? The second specifically unspinner command we're using here is called visited count. And you'll see we're wrapping it in squiggly brackets like we do when we interpolate a variable into a line. And that's going to return how many times we've visited the specific node. We could technically do this all in one. You could use visited count and check if it was greater than zero to do the same thing without using visited, but why do that? So if I run this by going command shift P and going preview dialog, you'll see, do you want to go to the special node? If I say no, it'll just take me back to the front. I'm going to put this over here so you can see actually. So, oh, how exciting. Do you want to go to the special node? No. And it jumps back to the start. So it's going to keep asking the same question until I do something. Because we can jump to the same node. If I go to the special node, we're now in the special node, so it says this is the special node. And then we continue, we go back to the main one. Now because we have visited a special node, it knows we've visited a special node, and it can say we've visited it one times. And if I keep going, it'll just count up, right? It's fairly useful to keep track of state in story. That's one example. Uh, what am I going to do now? You can also roll dice, so you can go... I'm just going to... Did I write this one? No, I didn't write this one. Okay, title, start, dodgy gambler. Do you want to roll a dice? Now, I'm not going to give them a choice because they're a dodgy gambler. We're going to roll a dice. Dodgy gambler is going to say, you rolled a dice. And that's literally everything we're going to do. Right? So, boop, boop. And we roll it, run it again, roll the five, run it again, roll the four. So there's a dice roll in there, that's a six sided dice, whatever you put in there. That's fine. There's a bunch of other commands. I'm not going to go through them, but if you look at docs.yarnspin.dev, you'll see all the great commands we have. You can, of course, build your own commands, but I'll get to that in a minute when I show you how it works with Unity. So, da -da -da. what am I going to show you next? Uh, so, one of the great things that Yarnspinner can do, and this ties into the fact that we've designed this. So Twine is amazing, and Twine and Yarn Spinner kind of started life as what if we could put Twine in Unity? And there are ways to put actual Twine in Unity, but what we thought was really important was making a suite of tools that made game development and all the things that professional games or larger games, even if they're indie or not professional, require. So Yarn Spinner has a lot of features that are designed to make your life easier if you're a kind of an actual game developer, even if that means you're just a student team or a game jam team. And one of those is you can export a spreadsheet. So I'm not going to do it because I haven't got an interesting conversation to show you, but I've got a demo spreadsheet to show you. So you can go export dialogue as recording spreadsheet, which will literally just save out a spreadsheet from your thing. I don't even know how you zoom in Excel. Oh, you can just pinch. Uh, it will color code it based on character and it'll spit out any tags. So these tags over on the side are, you can, on any line inside Yarn Spinner, you can put a tag. And that's something you can access when you use Yarn in a game engine. So you can make whatever you, whatever you want happen based on that. Uh, the compiler will always send the tag last line when you have a bunch of lines before an option. So if it's about to kick to a player choice, you'll be sent the tag last line. So you'll know that's something you can act on if you want to. But yeah, tags are quite useful because you can uh, localize with them. It's how we, I'll show you localization in a minute if we get time, but yeah, quite useful. But the spreadsheet is, means you can spit out a list of things in order. We try and group lines that are consecutive, so if you're doing VO, people can think about that sensibly, but people pull spreadsheets in and out of Yarn Spinner a lot for all sorts of things, and we see people use this in new ways pretty much every day and every time we come to a conference, which is great fun. So that's quite useful. Uh, as we know, the game industry runs on spreadsheets. We figure we should get in on that action. I'm going to close that because I don't want Excel to run. Okay. What are we going to do now? Let's look, let's look at Unity. I'm just going to ignore my slides until the end and we'll consider going back to them later. So, I am going to close this and not save it. Don't know what that is, but I'm going to close it. Sure, why not? Save. I'm going to close that. I'm going to go here. This is Unity. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, this is an empty scene. I've done nothing in this project beyond create two completely empty game nodes, which I'll get to in a minute. It's for part of a demo that I might get to. And I've installed the Yarn Spinner package into the package manager. 
which might complain. Yeah, so there's a yarn spinner package here. This is our preferred way for you to install yarn spinner inside Unity. There are equivalents for all the other engines. You can buy yarn spinner from itch, you can buy yarn spinner from the Unity asset store, or you can use the free package from OpenUPM or GitHub. They're all functionally the same thing. The only reason we sell it is to make money because we need money to keep making yarn spinner. But it is otherwise all free. So if you feel like you love yarn spinner and want to support it, that's great. But if you don't want to pay for it or can't afford it, that's totally fine. Please use the open source version. That's what it's there for. It will always be free and open source. So the package is installed, along with a bunch of other crap that is a package in Unity for some reason. Um, what I'm going to do now is show you how relatively easy it is to get a story into Unity. So with Yarn Spinner installed, it adds more stuff. Where is the unit? Isn't that interesting? Hmm? Yeah? Hang on. The Yarn Spinner is missing from the basin. Oh, it's in the middle now. It just moves around all the time. God. Unity. Okay. Yarn Spinner has added this to the, 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 the asset menu, so we're going to create a thing called a dialog runner. This is just a prefab over here that is the default way to make stuff. We don't necessarily expect you to use this out of the box. We expect you to customize this and make your own things, but you can kind of use it out of the box. So we've added this thing called we call a dialog system, which comes with a bunch of uh, dialog views, which I'll get to in a minute, but by default we have a line view. The line view draws the lines as they're displayed. The option view is the thing that lets players pick what they're saying. So the line view draws the lines that are being spoken at the player. The, the option view pr provides the player lines. Make sense? Yep. Okay. And we also need some dialog. So in my assets folder I have this lonely em empty narrative folder right here. Inside this one I'm going to create, look it's at the top there, see that's why I was confused, a yarn project. Can you see that? Yeah, okay, cool. A yarn project is the thing that we use to encapsulate all the information about what set of .yarn files you want to run for something. So I'm just going to call this demo project. And then next to it, I'm going to create, if my mouse works, a yarn script. This is just a shortcut to make a .yarn file. So you can just put .yarn files in the assets folder and leave them there and work with them. And I'm going to code demo script. So you'll see down here we have a demo project and a demo script. If I double click on the demo script, it will open. It's just in Visual Studio Code now. And I'm going to go and find that story that we were writing earlier and just paste it in because I'm creatively bankrupt after two straight weeks of Melbourne International, Wellington International Games Week. And here we have a story. So I'm just going to save that. Now there is a nice yarn story in there. You can see, you can see it over here just to prove it's the same file. In this demo project that is the, uh, the special asset that we call a .yarn project, you can see over here, it's just looking for all the yarn files that are near it. You can specifically add certain yarn files if you want and create multiple projects for certain things, and more complicated games will have multiple projects sometimes. You'll see the localization, it has the base language, it knows what languages are in there, you can add more languages and so on. Probably don't have time to go into that into detail today, but I'll kind of gloss over it in a bit. But right now it knows about our yarn file because it's basically pointed at it. So if I go over to this dialog system over here, and there's this thing called a dialog runner which wants a yarn project. So if I add my uh, yarn project to that, so now I'm pointing the dialog runner, which is the thing I put in the scene, to the yarn project which I just created in the assets. And it has two elements in the dialog views, the line view and the options view, which are the same things over here. And if I save that and run, Unity might crash. There we go. Okay, so now we're running the same dialogue we just had in Try and in Visual Studio Code inside Unity. So we can step through this. It's doing all the same stuff you saw earlier, delivering it line by line, except because I used a colon. Don't mind that. Boop, boop, boop. Don't worry about that. I used a colon, so it thinks there's a character, which means this line view puts characters at the top. And now we'll get to the jumps and you'll see the option view. Du, du, du. Du, du, du. Option view. Option view. So now you can pick. So we want to hear the poem, obviously. Now we actually want to hear the poem. I forgot that I did the whole thing where you don't actually jump anywhere. Here's a bad poem about options. 
pick this or that, your story's where it's at, your answer is pretty red. Anyway, let's keep learning. So you can see this just kind of magically works. This default dialog view is kind of the basic minimum thing you can get to make it work in your game. That's, that's enough. You can trigger this by interacting with the character. You can rig this up however you like. You can have multiple dialog systems all doing different things with different views on them. That's kind of the basics of it. So now I'm just going to start showing you a random grab bag of other things for five, ten minutes, and then we can ask questions if anyone has any questions. So one of my favorite things about Yarn Spinner is that you can very easily swap out the way things look. So you'll see here, I'm going to do this kind of a horrible, horrible quick way, but you'll get the gist. You'll see here Yarn Spinner ships with a bunch of prefabs. You are seeing the line view and the option list view and the option view, so you're seeing these three in action when the default dialog, but we've, we also ship this rounded one. So if I add, I think it's... I'm just going to zoom that out so I can read it. I'm going to add this one and this one into this, into this, and then I'm going to go over here and change which element has which in it. So I'm going to go line view in there and rounded options list view in there. So all I've done is added some new prefabs which are composed out of the way we expect you to compose a dialog view. There are docs for that. And now if I run this, oh, interesting. That's very interesting. Oh, okay. So I should put it back. I'm going to delete those. Drag to there. Drag to there. Thank you, John. God, clicking. Can you tell we've been at conferences for two weeks? Nope, missing dialogue view base. Done something weird, John. Oh, it's a option. Thank you. Okay, now I've put the correct things in. We're going to put that one there and that one there, and you'll see how easy it is <laughs> to do. Okay, there's a completely different dialogue view. All it took was just swapping it out. Very simple. This is just a rounded one, so you can have a slightly different look without having to think about it. And you'll see here, if there is a thing it thinks is a character, which is delineated by the colon at the beginning of a line, it will try and break the character out into the top. That is why it sometimes thinks parts of my line are co uh, characters, because I wasn't thinking very clearly when I wrote this at four in the morning a week ago. So you'll see now we have a nice bubbly option view. Doo -doo -doo. We keep clicking, we keep clicking, keep clicking, keep clicking, keep clicking, keep clicking. OK, so now you can pick. OK, so that's how quick it is to customize things. Now I'm going to show you a slightly more advanced example, because you know that seems gutsy at this point. Uh, here is a very simple 2D side scroller with a completely custom option view, which does Night in the Woods style speech bubbles, because that's you know we originally wrote this for Night in the Woods, so we felt that it was important to be able to uh, show things that look like Night in the Woods. So the option view here is, in fact, letting you scroll, I'm using the arrow keys, letting you scroll through things in a speech bubble. That's very customizable, but that is driven by exactly the same system as you saw driving the option views and the line views earlier. Uh, you can do this in 3D as well, so you can make whatever you want. This is just another quick example with the same kind of thing. The gist here is option views very customizable. You can make it do pretty much anything you like. And nothing hammers that home more. I'm going to close that because that project is cursed. Uh, we're going to open this one. Nothing hammers this home more than like uh, voiceover and localization because it kind of just makes it magic. So I'm going to open this project. Sure, we'll save. I could not have done anything stupid in preparation for this. I don't know if I have sound. Do I have sound? They didn't tell the poor AV guy that there was sound. But we'll see. Could be really loud. Ooh. Whoa. OK. Let's see what happens there. OK, that's being weird. But I don't actually know what's going on there. I'm going to show you a different example. This is a completely different example that does the same thing. You can play uh, audio as a line view. So in the case of an audio player, the audio is just a line view that's added to the list of line views. And when it receives a line, it plays the audio based on the tag attached to the line. Quite straightforward. This is an example of localization. So I am not from New Zealand, but I asked one of my friends who speaks Tereo Maori to check 
So I did a quick example with some Maori and some English. So this is the English version. You can say the internet slow, I agree or disagree. Oh well. So if I go into the dialog runner, which is running this, and check over here, you can see that we're running the English version, and Unity's being weird, and we go down to find Maori, which is here, and run this again. Apologies, the idioms are probably weird and wrong, but the gist is there. Now it's spitting out the Mario version of the same thing because we just told it was playing that. And again, I've been told the idioms are slightly off or it's like too, slightly too informal, too informal, but you get the idea because it's for a quick demo. So the way this is working is if I open this in some other accursed program, you will see that we have the yarn file, which is the, the base thing that we're running. So it's the language that you wrote in originally. And we've automatically tagged each line, which is something you can ask Yarnspinner to do. And based on those tags, we've then exported a bunch of strings, which we can get here. You can see here. And then with those strings, we've translated them and provided the Maori version, and then added as many languages as we like. So we have our own localization system, but we also support Unity localization. So you can pick which one you want to use in the case of the Unity plugin. And it just magically works. And if we had audio, the audio would, I'll show you, I'll go back to the, the, the demo that was slightly broken a second ago. I'm not going to run it, but I'll show you that. So the dialog runner here has an extra voice overview on it, which is the thing that dictates uh, what's, what file is going to run. And it will run the file based on, and da -da -da -da. so you see here, this is the intro project. It's basically two characters floating in space having a conversation with each other. And you'll see there's got these line names here. And if you go over here and go into the voiceovers, you'll see the, the voiceover files match the line names. It's just finding them automatically for you. And that's kind of magic. Now, do I want to show one more thing or do I want to stop? Uh, I'll show you last minute. So the other kind of thing we did earlier this year, this started as an April Fool's joke, as all good things do. I assume that's where Unity began. Um, we wrote Yarn Spinner for books. This is. Uh, at books.yarnspinner.dev, and this is a great way to teach people a little bit of game development if you want to get people inspired. This lets you create books with Yarnspinner. So this is based on the same technology we used for Try. It's basically Try under the hood, so you can just play it like Try. But if you hit the PDF button and click Update, this will generate a full Choose Your Own Adventure book based on the Yarn story that you have put in there. So this is going to take a second because it's going to the internet, so I'm using Conference Center Internet. And you know, that's fun. So it, it's got, it spins up a full LaTeX typeset under the hood and typesets this thing into a old fashioned chart style choose your own adventure where it splits out everything into pages. So if you have options and variables and like flow, flow control using if statements and stuff, that will all work. So it's very possible to generate a, like a 10 line yarn screen script, which then generates a hundred page book because every permutation will be generated. So if you want to write a really long book very quickly, this is a great way to do it. Um, speaking of that, what we've got here is a fun example. This is a very short yarn script. So you can see it's quite short, it's 45 lines with a lot of comments. It is a combination lock. So if I play this here, you'll see it's randomly set a solution, which is two, two, three, and then it's telling you each line, the lock reads zero, zero, turn the left number, now it's one, and so on. So I can play it like that, but more fun is I can go PDF and get the PDF version. <laughs> Uh, and you will see that it will generate quite a long PDF. So we've got 68 pages. <laughs> and now we can unlock the combination lock. I don't actually know what the combination lock is. I don't know if it's reset the combination or not, but let's assume it hasn't. So unlike when you're playing... <laughs> Good. I'm glad we see the appeal. Uh, when you're playing in try or in the play mode of books, the, uh, the random number is, is apparently set every time you click start. When you generate a PDF, the random number is set once. We're not like magically using the horrible, did you know PDFs can execute JavaScript? Well, they can. Don't do that. We're not <laughs> creating a dynamic PDF. So it's set once for the PDF that you've generated. So you can't, you know, let's, I think it was 221, right? No, okay, clearly I've reset it there. It'll be different, yeah. So there we go. But yeah. Uh, that's books, the Yarn Spinner for books. We think it's a really great way to get people inspired about writing branching narratives because it kind of combines the cool old technology of branching path books and video games, but it's not a video game, which means it's slightly less cursed. So I'm going to go back to my slides and finish because we've got, I think, 10 minutes left if anyone has any questions. Uh, that's the Yarn Spinner for Unity. Burp, 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 burp. Thank you. Right, great. <laughs> 
think we have 10 minutes for questions, unless I've drastically missed time. The rest of the Yarn Spinner team is here. If anyone has any more questions, they can come up and answer them too. Or we can just go and stand awkwardly outside. Thank you for listening. John has a question, who is one of the Yarnspinner developers, apparently. Oh, good. I moved the audio files out of the same folder. That's why it's not finding it. Wonderful. It was working about an hour ago. Well, so it might have been my fault. It's fine. Anyway, oops. That's fine. <laughs> the person behind you in the colourful jacket. Apparently we have a microphone, which I'm happy to repeat your question if you'd like, but... Sure, I can... It's, is it ooh, ooh, there, Yep. Oh, okay. Um, okay, yeah. My question was, we looked before at, um, like, the player having, like, coins and you add to the coins. Um, how does Yarn Spinner integrate with the, like, game inventory data and things like that? So you can register like? functions back and forth that you can call from each other. Okay. But you can also define a specific way stuff is stored. So if you look at a dialogue runner, da, 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 you'll see there's a variable storage thing here. So you can specify how your variables are stored. By default, we just store stuff in, in memory, unless you give us another way. But you can hook into whatever system your game is already using to store, to store data. Um, but also, you, I didn't mention it because it's slightly more advanced. You can create your own functions. So like the dice rolling thing, you can create a function in C Sharp, for example, in Unity add a little tag that says this is a yarn command, which will expose that to yarn and make it available. And you can also pass data back and forth between the two. So you can always get things in and out of each, each side. But yeah, for variable storage, you can pretty much do whatever you like. By default, we'll just put it in memory. Cool. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? I'll let the person in the green hat handle picking the questions so I don't feel bad. <laughs> Um, whereabouts might we find, do you have like a database of like the language used and all the like sort of learning surrounding this, for example, for team members who might not have been able to attend these talks? For learning Yarn Spinner, like, the yeah. best way to do it is to go to docs.yarnspinner.dev. I am the primary person that writes these at the moment, so if it's bad, please complain to John. <laughs> and you can learn here. Uh, we recommend you go through the thing we call the beginner's guide, which basically says the same structure that I took in the talk, which is basically learn the syntax using try, then move into writing the syntax with Visual Studio Code, and then play with the game engine. So yeah, a, a lot of people get very excited to make their, like, you know, it's Skyrim, but it's an MMO, but it's also got narrative <laughs> thing and to try and start at the third step. I would recommend making a bunch of very small games using Try and Visual Studio Code first if this is something that interests you and you are not trying to fit this into a professional or large game development project because otherwise you will jump too far ahead and get confused and stressed. I jump too far ahead and get confused and stressed all the time, as you saw. So the best way to learn Yarn Spinner is to play with Try and then move to Visual Studio Code. Uh, don't be tempted to do otherwise. But everything you need to know is here, and you can learn all the bits and pieces you need. We also have a pretty active Discord, because it's a full open source community. Jump on the Discord, chat to people, ask questions. There's a lot of like frequently asked questions and how do I, you know, how do I make wavy text like Night in the Woods, how do I print things? We've tried to answer most of the common questions here. We've also got a couple of very specific tutorial projects that instead of just being guides, tell you how to make certain kinds of games. So for example, this one is basically a choose your path game that just kind of goes through and tells you how to rig the thing I just showed you up to a bunch of characters, so you can click a character to talk to them and stuff like that. And uh, we've also got a quick NPC dialogue game where you can, you know, wander around and talk to things. So you have to solve a mystery in a graveyard by talking to the various graves. We also like to make money because this project is open source. We sell a bunch of assets, so you can buy Yarn Spinner. As I said, that's the free thing. But these two are not part of the open source project, so we've cloned the speech bubbles from Night in the Woods, which we we worked on, so we felt that was okay. And the dialogue wheel from Matt, like Mass Effect or Dragon Age, you can also buy that. These are really good ways to show how flexible the dialogue system is. Um, yeah. Sweet as, thank you very much. Thank you. Does Yarn Spinner has a function that um, typing sound play based on the character? And then can how custom if they do how customizable is that? So do, do you mean type it? Can the player type in text? Is that what you mean? Or? Yeah, when the text prints like the 
sound effect plays by every character or every word. Oh, you can you can t control the typewriter effect that we have by default, which kind of prints out the things a bit. But you can also write your own dialogue view that does literally whatever you want. A dialogue view basically just takes each line as the unspinner sends it into the game engine, then does something with it. So some of them play a sound file based on the tag. Some of them display them on screen, character by character, word by word, what, literally whatever you like. You could you know ignore it all if you want. You could print it, like you could send every line to a literal printer. <laughs> Maybe we should do that. No, I mean not the combo lock, yeah. Sorry. Hello, I'm one of those writer types you were talking about. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> the curse of yeah. my life. Yes, carry on, sorry. What did he, what did he say? <laughs> um, have you found, I mean, you've obviously got a lot of, uh, I mean, well done, it's really cool, cool. Um, but um, have other people using uh, Yarn Spinner, have they developed other sort of interfaces with it, high level interfaces as such, um, that maybe have a different way rather than the top down code level? Yes, there's lots of weird shit people do. So Yarn Spinner's audience is a fabulous combination of about 40% extremely large in professional studios making games that we're trying to make money from, or they're trying to make money from, uh, 40 percent extremely horny queer games, <laughs> and the rest is basically educators or academics teaching game development. So we've seen all sorts of stuff come out of the, 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 the way that Young's been delivers to. I think I, I, I saw one that uses one of those um, at GDC a few years ago, one of those like water printers that like injects water out of a nozzle at high speed from a roof and drops letters out of the ceiling to do a story. Um, and there's all sorts of mad stuff like that. So yeah, you can pretty much do anything you like. Um, some, some guy was trying to hook it up to a fax machine. He was trying to explain it to me at GCAP. Yeah. I don't know what he was trying to do. Just sort of clari <laughs> just to clarify the question, if you look at other, oh. other pieces of software that are in the same space, yes. I can have quite, quite a kind of like a modular approach. I mean, especially when you look at branching dialogue, where you're doing things in more like a post-it note form, or, almost as it were, as, as dialogue elements. And I just wonder whether th there'd been a level of customization that had been put on top of uh, the, 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 the standard yarn spinner that had facilitated those that kind of interaction always. I think maybe John can answer that question for you. John, what do you think? Um, sorry, I was actually watching, I was actually watching the uh, thing. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> um, sorry, that wasn't a joke. I was actually watching the thing. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. But no, it's just about um, where other, uh, they've all heard it. Um, I know. <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm very embarrassed. That's okay. No, there are, there are other um, pieces of software within this, within this space that use like a more modular approach, like post notes. Oh, yes, 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 yeah. So has, ah, okay. has there been that level of interface? I get you. Oh, as in, as in building their own like, like uh, UIs on top yeah. to be able to... Uh, there to are a it. few different editors that kind of do different things that if you look on our website, we link to them in the add-on section, I think, in the docs. I do not think that anyone has taken, like it's nobody's made like Artisy that sits on top of Yarn Spinner, for example, yeah. but you could do that. We have a product that we're working on called Story Solver, which these two gave a talk about earlier today, which kind of adds another layer to things. So if you want to check that out, you can learn about that at yarnspinner.dev slash story solver, which is not quite what you're asking for, but it is a different view onto things. You could very easily build a UI that does something slightly different on top of this, yes. But like I don't think anyone has. If your question is, like, I would like to be able to manage uh, individual lines and view them as a graph so I can see the cascade of them, uh, to our knowledge, no one's done that specific thing, but we also provide lots and lots of APIs that allow you to visualize uh, that yourself. So even if we don't have one there already, it's very, very easy for a programmer to create one um, I know exactly how I'd start and, would, and I'd be done within about an hour. So if, if you think of a way that you would like to visualize this kind of stuff and tell us and we think it's useful, we'll probably just make it. So if you can look at this and think of a better way to do something, please tell us because it probably means it will be useful for other people as well. I think we are pretty fixated on keeping it as a very simple text thing where there is a view where you can kind of generate a graph, but it's, the, the graph is not the view, is, is not the data, but because we've found that writers like to keep it, most writers, you might be the weird one, we don't know, but most writers like to keep it really simple and in a text format which lets them do whatever they like with it because a lot of them are writing on like, you know, those weird special purpose like singular writing devices that people buy or they're writing in like a notebook and then transferring it. So they're thinking about it completely analog or effectively analog on a computer before they start playing with the unspinner. So we have not yet encountered that, but we would love to talk if you have an idea. Great, cool. thank you. I don't know how much time we have for questions, so I'm going to keep answering them until you stop. No more? We're done? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Please find us.